Good morning. Everybody awake? I'm not sure I am, but we'll see what goes on here. So welcome to a journey into non-virtual polymorphism, whatever that means. And I'm Rod Merriam. So I call my talks journeys because I want to take you from wherever you are to someplace else with the knowledge about whatever my topic is. And hopefully when you get done, you leave here, you go home, you'll start using it in your code, whether it's a hobby or professional work. But it's also a journey for me. Now, I'm a developer. I'm not on a standards committee. I'm not a trainer. I'm a developer. And I've got this erratic amount of knowledge about C++, you know. But there's certain topics that, you know, I know a little bit about, and I'm comfortable proposing a talk about them. And then that starts my journey because I've got to elevate my knowledge. I've got to do a lot more reading, a lot more research. And that journey takes me into some odd byways at times. Some of them I bring into the talk. Some of them I just toss in little tidbits. Some of them put aside, they'll be used for another talk. So we're both on a journey with this process. My real journey with C++ started with this. Who does not recognize this screenshot? Uh, not too many youngsters here. Of course, youngsters to me is anybody under 50. This was Borland's Turbo C++ released in 1990. In August of 1990, I was at the Hilton Waikiki reading the manuals from this. I was with my ex-wife. I was the sp spouse for a conference that she was attending. I was sitting by the poolside reading the books. Tough job. Somebody's got to do it. General background, I started in 1968 with Fortran, done a bunch of languages. I've taught C++ at University of Houston Clear Lake. I've used it in competitions for NASA and National Institute of Science and Technology. And I've done some writing on it in the 90s in Hackaday.com and Medium.com currently. So, had a few steps in there. Well, that went one beyond where I wanted. Greek, many forms, obligatory statement. Everybody seems to say, have to say, polymorphism is from the Greek, meaning many forms. I don't know what that's supposed to tell us, but it seems obligatory. Okay, quote I got out of Wik Wikipedia and reversed it a little bit. The use of a single symbol to represent multiple different types. In other words, we're talking about polymorphic variables. And then we've got, or the provision of a single interface to entities of different types. Polymorphic invocables. We kind of call them functions usually, but we're C++. We'll say that's invocables because there's, a, there's more than functions that we deal with. And as I went through all this research and think, looking at things, <clears throat> I decided that polymorphism is type-based dispatch. Now, I'm not sure if all the experts would agree with me, but this seems to fit my mindset at least. And then the interesting thing is, the real challenge is not finding invocables. We know how to do that. The challenge is finding variables that will hold polymorphic values or types. So polymorphic variables, we know the standard one, inheritance tree, virtual functions, pointer to the base class, you can execute the function out of a derived class. I'm talking about non-virtual polymorphism, but I'm not at all saying or implying that virtual polymorphism through inheritance is bad. It's not. I've got my own comments and thoughts about the naysayers, but just, I'm not saying it's bad. You shouldn't use it. But there are places and techniques to use when this doesn't work well. And that's the problem, is too many people see virtual polymorphism as a hammer, and everything then becomes a nail. And they want to force everything into some kind of inheritance tree to do it. We've got some other techniques. That's what I'm going to show you. Standard template library provides us some polymorphic variables. Any stud variant. And then I'm going to bring in a little bit of a ringer. It's close enough that I want to talk about it. 
and that's stud tuple. That may be surprising. We'll see where we see what you think after I get done. <clears throat> Polymorphic convocables. Well, we've done this since the beginning. One of the neat things with C++ when it came out was object and function overloading. I can remember reading about this back, uh, Algol coming out, or Ada, I forget which one it was. Then why would you ever want to do that? Now I know. I really like it. So you got integer plus, two integer parameters, string plus, two string parameters. You add them or you can cat can concatenate, concatenate them. So same function, name, but different types. We also got the auto parameters and templates. And we could spend probably two hours talking about how to do all this properly, because what if you had an int and a float and a double and a float, and which one's first, which one's, which one's left, which one's right, and covering all the combinations. Fortunately, there's some techniques to deal with that, but we're not going to talk about those. <clears throat> and then we have the curiously recurring template pattern. And it's confusing because the name doesn't say anything about the pattern itself. It came from John Coplian in the 90s, and who decided, saw this pattern reoccurring. And he said, that's curious. And he named it after the curiosity that was seeing, the fact that he was seeing this pattern occurring. So conceptware alert. Most people call this slideware. Same thing. The code here is going to work under GCC 13.2 both under 17, 20, and 23, um, except maybe for 17. I may have tweaked something you know, in the last week or so since I tested this. It's the most likely place that it's not going to work. This is not ideal C++ code. I'll point out a couple of examples to illustrate this. But you can take this, but you can take the code off the slides, put it in your compiler, and it should work if you get all the rest of the infrastructure in place. But you know, it's not going to be ideal. So we have digital pin. My background is embedded systems, and I still play around with Arduinos and Raspberry Pis and so forth. They communicate through the world with pins. And so there's a digital pin on them, which is either on or off. So it's a Boolean variable. And that's what it's, the value for it is uh, in this class. We're setting up some infrastructure to work with through the rest of the code that I'm going to work show you. Note this lambda. I want you to remember this. You're going to remember this 20 minutes later. Basically, it just calls the pin set function and does whatever a set would require, be required to do. And then we've got analog pins, which have a value from 0 to whatever voltage of the processor is. So it's a variable amount. Um, so it's got an integer as its value. And serial port, it's got a port number, which is an integer. could be a handle to the file system, like on Linux. And it takes a string. It's going to output a string message. And I purposely took these three because they're disparate classes. It's kind of hard to see how you can fit them into an inheritance tree. We create some variables so we can work with them later on. Two digitals, an analog, and a serial. The big question, and to put this all into a context of what we're trying to do, is when we've got a container like vector, and we want to put these things in the vector so we can walk through them, um, say when we're generating the outputs, we want to do all the outputs all at once. Boom. We don't want outputs going out at different times in an embedded system. So what's the polymorphic type that we put in here? And then the next question is, what's the polymorphic invocation that we do in our range for loop or whatever, however we're going to walk through the container? What do we use there? Stud any. It takes anything, anytime, anywhere. I find it difficult to work with as a polymorphic variable in the context that we're 
we're talking here. I almost didn't include it in the show talk, but I thought I'd bring it in here just so somebody who likes it the way it does work um, can use it. But I'm going backwards. Catch up. Okay. Um, and if you want to use it, fine, go ahead. I just don't particularly care for it. Don't think I'd use it. So stud any things to remember about it is it dynamically allocates memory. So in general, it wouldn't be terrific use in an embedded system because you can't do a lot of dynamic allocation of memory in dynamic system. You wind up with a, a, a screwed up memory bank and you finally wind up running out of memory. Not the memory isn't free, but there's not a chunk big enough to put what you want to put in there. So it does dynamically allocate memory, and it, you, but it does have the option of doing some small buffer optimization. I've heard GCC's got a small buffer, comparatively c has got a somewhat larger one. I don't know what the extent of them is. And then to get at something, the value that's in stud any, you've got to do an any cast and tell it the type of data that you're looking for. And if you guess wrong at what that data type is, it's going to throw an exception. And I don't find it particularly easy to find the type. So that makes it difficult to invoke the function on there because the, there's no ready-made library function to invoke something on any. So you've got to know the type. It's not easy to work with. Let's look at it. So we write a routine we call out any, takes in a, a, a stud any, and we start working with it. And what we've got to access is val type, which tells us the type info reference, which is runtime type information, you know, big table and the, t the compiler builds as it's going along. And then we get the type index from it. So we've got a number, a value, that we can use. Type index can't be used in a switch statement. I'm not sure what type index is. I haven't investigated. So you've got to build this if, else if table, where you check the value type that you're working with with all of the other types that may possibly be in there. And since any can have anything in there, how do you know what types to check it against? How do you get the types? We do a type ID on the, on the, uh, the data type, use type index, save it off once as a static here. There may be a better way of doing this, but that's you know, how you work with it. As I say, I don't care for it. Your mileage may vary. Stud variant, type safe union. We know what a union is. You, you can have a union, you got an integer, you got a float, you got a double. You can put stub data in the double, take it out as an int called type punny, and you'll be very amazed at what that value is because it bears no reference to any known integer in the world, probably. Uh, you can try and fake it. You put a struct around it, put an enum in there, enum in there to track what data type you last stored. Well, don't bother. That's what stud variant does for you. So it takes a list of the class types that it will handle. So you know what types you're constrained. Values are stored in the variant. So whatever your biggest type is, it's going to allocate that much memory. So if you've got big, enormous, enormous type, it's going to put it in there. You may be wasting a lot of space if most of the time you're working with integers and doubles probably want to rethink how to handle that. It doesn't do any dynamic memory allocation. But what you put in there may, so it's not, can't say that there's no memory allocation with stud variant. Put a vector in there. Whatever data space vector needs, you're going to, it's going to allocate. Whatever string needs for space, it's going to allocate. So there is dynamic allocation involved, just not for plain old data types, at least. Straightforward access to values. You can get a value either through the data type 
or a position in the data type lists. Look at that. So we're gonna create a variant with pointers to digital pin, analog pin, and serial port. And I'm using pointers because I still want to access my underlying variables. If I put the variable in there, if I just put a digital pin in there, I have no way of knowing where it is. And I can't, don't want to copy from my digi variable because then if I change a value in digi, it's not going to show up on here. So I got to work through pointers. I don't care for that, but that's the way C++ works. So we can assign the address of digi during initialization. We can get it by saying get zero, because it's the zero uh, type in the list, and call set. We can put, we can also access, we can directly assign serial, and we can get it by saying I want the serial port. If I send, say, I want it, the, the analog port, it's going to throw an exception because it's going to say, no, I don't have an analog port here, pin here. So let's look at how we would walk through the list um, a vector uh, executing each value here. So we put in the body of the for loop here a lambda. And we're going to do an immediate call of the lambda passing in O, the element, at the end here. Uh, I threw this in because I'm not sure everybody realizes you can do immediate calls of lambda like this. One of those little side paths that I, that I found. So the way of getting at the index that is the position in the type list is through index. And that's fairly straightforward. You can put it in a switch. We can, our zeroth element is the digital pin. First is analog pin. Second is the serial port. It works very nicely. We can also do it with if. If we replaced our other um, lambda with this lambda, take in a value again, and we do the big if, else, if, whatever. And we do get if. It takes the pointer to the value, checks whether, in this case, that's so highlighted, whether it's the pointer to the serial port. If it is, it returns the value. If it isn't, then it returns null pointer. So you can go through creating all the uh, tests for whatever values you've got, the data types that you're using. So we've kind of answered this question, for variant at least, we can put our variant definition in the vector, assign the uh, addresses for it. And we can call stud visit with a function and the variant that we're working with, in this case, O. So O is processed by stud visit to determine its data type and passed to overload, the, this out overload function, by doing a cast to the appropriate value. Yeah. Okay. Note that you can have more than one variant with visit. So if you have multiple variants, it will pass each of those values in to your calling function as values. So just pick an example here. If I had my output routines needed values instead of having them set in the class, you could have your values in one variant and the data type in the other, the variable in the other, and it would combine them and send them to that function to do the output. Which brings us to what does that out overload look like? And this is the overload idiom, and we to as pattern 
various descriptions. I kind of like to think of it as an idiom. It's a polymorphic invocable with lambdas all the way down. So here's overload. It's template with template pack, and it's obvious what it's doing. So, okay. Let's look at how we use it first, and then I'll explain what it's doing. So we create out overload, our function, and we call, we put in three lambdas. Each of these lambdas will call the specific data type that it's supposed to work with. Remember that lambda I mentioned way back a few minutes ago? Well, here's where we put it in there. And, you know, you get these, you know something in your head, but you don't really understand it, have it internalized. This is one of the things I did. Well, using the lambdas, writing the lambdas out in the digit, in the, uh, in the overload, I realized, oh, I could probably just put the name in there, make it a little bit more compact there, simple. And I can define a lambda back where I know what's going on, back at the class, like I did for digital pin. Got to pick up those things as you go along. So, We'll get there. We'll, we'll take comments later on, because I have a hard time hearing, so I'll need you to use the mic and comment. So what does this kind of look like? This struct overload, and it basically brings in the call operators for each of the lambdas and puts them in, you know, stacks them up one after another in the structure. Now remember that a lambda is a class. If you've got a capture clause on a lambda, that goes to the constructor, and it creates data members for each of those elements. And then the body of the lambda becomes the call operator. So that's what this is doing, is it's simply moving the call operators into this structure. Thanks to Andres Fertig for CPP Insights, because I ran the code through there, trimmed it all out to get rid of all the extra stuff that you know, doesn't explain a lot but it needs to be there and boils down to this. So what are we doing with the overload pattern? Idiom. It's got the template packet list on it. And it's saying inherit from each of these template, these types. And then it says for each of these types, use their uh, call operator. Remember, using says, from my parent, use it. I don't want to define it here, but I want it here, so use it. Use the one from my parent. Again, what does it look like? In effect, it compiles down to overload with the template list of all the different types, and then the public inheritance of all of them, and then a using statement for each of the call operators. I like looking at this stuff from CP Insights because it gives me a better perspective on what's actually going on, a little bit better understanding what's working on. I used to think everybody should know assembly language before it got too confusing for everybody to understand because it gave you a better understanding of what was going on with Fortran or other languages. So I had another actually used overload in a situation where I was sending messages to a robot and I'm getting back messages over a serial port. And the message comes back, it's got a header and then it's got a block of data which are basically bytes, unsigned 8-bit integers. And so I needed to walk through this message picking out each data type and it could be a Boolean, it could be an integer, it could be a could it be a big integer or pair of integers that were a scaled floating point number? A lot of things. So, message points to the position in the buffer, and I say, I want a Boolean from this. So I get the Boolean, and I get the message out. So the main point here is also using return param parameters here. It gets tricky doing return values because you don't have the signature hook. Like here, we know we've got a boolean, we're asked for a boolean, but with return type, doesn't know what 
call operator to, to use. Oh, I always forget that I did that. So what does this look like when we try it? If we put in the Boolean, a character, and an unsigned integer, we just call it, increment the message, and we get our values out. This works fairly nicely. It's a bit bare bones here. The position and the message are done a little bit much cleaner in my actual implementation. So this is very much a, a skeleton concept where type piece of code. You can do the call operators yourself. You know, struct convert is the same basic operation we've seen, just could put the call operators there in the structure yourself and you can call it. What you're missing is you don't have the lambda capture. You don't have that, don't have then a constructor. And the capture makes things really convenient because that's what I use to pass in um, the message and pass uh, position of the message to my actual code when I was decoding the serial port message. So if you got a simple set of operations like I'm showing here, works fine. Get more complex, you probably want to stick with lambdas. So it's usable as a polar morphic invocable. It can return values as well as output parameters, but you've got to be careful because you've got to make sure you don't have duplicate signatures. Probably is going to come back and say, this is ambiguous. You've got two different, two different places where you're passing in the same signature. You can use different parameters and returns in the same overload. They don't have to have the same similar signature, but that's probably not a great idea unless there's some real compelling case to do it that way. So my look at variables, I don't care for stud any. It's just too difficult to get at the data types. Stud variant work seems to work very well in my opinion, and it works well with the overload any. You probably could use the overload with stud any. I just didn't, didn't work with it or give it as an example. Stud tuple is container-like. And you'll see why I'm using the term like in a minute. So we can create a tuple, two digital pins, analog pin, and serial port. Those are being actual values that are going to go into the tuple. We will create the tuple. And it's similar to variant that we use the get zero to get the value from the tuple and call our routines. We can call for the first zeros for the first digital, one for the second digital, and we pass it out overload. So the overload idiom works also. And we can get it by data type. And that's convenient to a point. If I try and get two digital pin, if I try and say digital pin, it's going to say, I don't know which one you mean. You got two of them here. Similar to visit is stud apply. We can create a lambda, and I did it outside the uh, the call for apply, just to be clear, clear here. And it also does the whole set of games with temp template type packs. The first thing it does is for each data type, it creates a variable, uh, a parameter for it in Okay, creates a variable for it in the call list. So for our case, we would have four arguments, four parameters. If you had 100 types, it would create one that was 100 long. And then it creates a call for each of them to out overload. So again, for our case, we're going to get four of them. If you had 100, you'd get 100 calls to out overload. In effect, looks like this. Uh, my monitor keeps going blank. Uh, so we get the four, four types as call arguments and the four out overload um, calls. Fairly straightforward. 
We can also do a make tuple. And in this case, I'm putting the, t the, p the variables directly into the tuple because that allows me to get at them by using a structured binding reference. So now I've got names assigned to each of the positions in the tuple, which I couldn't do before easily when I was using a vector or a container. So that's why I say this is kind of container-like. You can put the values in, you can get at them, and you can work with them. Um, if I change the value for our analog to 21, it was constructed with 42, comes out, apply, apply, do the apply to it, and I get my value out. So that makes me kind of like tuple for various reasons. I'm reading in CPP reference about tuple. And come across this line that says, and things that are tuple-like. And standard pair is tuple-like. OK, that's obvious. It's a tuple with two. Stud array. What? And it turns out stud ranges, subranges, is tuple-like. And there's certain characteristics, like implementing get zero template that make something tuple-like. So I said, OK, I got to explore this. One of my little side branches, but I think it's still interesting enough to bring in here, applicable enough to bring in here. So I create an array, and it's tuple-like. Here's where I get the like from. We create an output function, put it in apply, and we can call it, and we get one and two as output. One of the other things we can do is we can do a concatenate tuples, which means you can concatenate std array. Now, std arrays are fixed length, just as tuples are, but this gives you some ability to do some variations in stud array length. You could got four or five different stud arrays that you want to use mix and match combinations of them. You can do them by concatenating them and passing them along. And then I'm thinking, this stud apply, that's a loop unroll for stud array. Loop unrolling is where you take, you're going to do 100 elements, process 100 elements, and you really want the best, fastest thing you can do there, and you spell, make a list of the 100 calls of the functions, changing them, passing in each array, each element of the array for the, for, uh, on each line. Now, back when some crazy days in the teens, I was, um, got onto one of these competition websites and did some stuff where, you know, they give you 100,000 records you got to process, and I finally gave up because I didn't like crappy, write junky code to make it fast. But I was doing this, I was processing 100,000 elements in a, a for loop, one at a time. And I thought, well, maybe I could try let loop unrolling, see if what improvement I get. So I did, I don't know, 10 or 20 in a loop rather than just one. It made a significant difference. There's a lot more overhead than you would think of with I think I think there would be with incrementing counters, testing, and jumping back. So this may be an interesting technique with stud array um, to do some loop unrolling automatically for you because it that's what it does. So stud tuple is container-like. Stud apply is loop-like. And the overload idiom works with stud apply. So there's an interesting possibility of using tuples in uh, w when you're reaching for polymorphic type operation. Curiously, reoccurring template pattern. I already mentioned this. You were in Daisy Holman's talk yesterday, I was just grinning at her slides because they were just about the same pattern as, as slides that I have here. We start, and we'll use a different inheritance tree because this is the one that people always have fights over. Shapes, and you're going to draw shapes. And you've got rectangles and squares and triangles. Look here. 
And people get into these tussles about whether a square inherits from rectangle or a rectangle inherits from square because one's got two sides of lengths for their sides and the other's got only one side. And they're focused on behavior. And they want to jam everything into the inheritance tree because of behavior. And they're totally ignoring state. State is equally important. If your states are different, it's not really is a. OK. Off my soapbox on that one. So we're going to do draw shape. And for our rectangle, we inherit from shape, and we tell it who we are. Same thing with square triangle. We tell it who we are. And then we create a variable, remember, a variable derived, which is the this pointer cast to the data type. And this, for the first case, would be, say, rectangle. And we can use a static cast here because we know exactly what types are going to be passed in. We don't have to do any of the other more complicated casts. So we've got that working well. And we draw, draw impl, which is the members of the, 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 uh, the underlying, the derived classes. And it's easy to call. Greater rectangle, square triangle, just call draw, and it does the work for you. I don't like draw impl hanging out there public. You know darn well, somebody's going to call it directly instead of calling the draw that shape defines. So I, I'm going to break my rule and put an access specifier in here. And you got to tell, say it's a friend. The shape is a friend, so we're going to access it. One of the reasons why I'm suggesting you want to keep draw impl private is hypothetical case here. Shape knows what surface it's drawing on, passes as a, a, as a parameter to rectangle. So rectangle doesn't have to have a member, data member, that calls what shape it's working with. It gets its information from shape. And then there's the whole question of whether rectangle should be worrying about how it gets drawn, because it's not really a property of a rectangle. Rectangles don't draw themselves. Um, so what if we have another function we call erase? And erase and draw are just the inverse of one another. If I can draw a rectangle, I can erase a rectangle. It's just putting back what I took away. So we make erase call draw, passing in a parameter to draw, which whether we're doing erase or a draw. Well, we don't want to repeat all that static cast stuff. So we make it its own separate function and do the cast in the return statement. And this generates no code. It's just telling the compiler, hey, when you see this function, slap in this other stuff for me. This is one of the neat things I found about C++ back when I started working with it, was inline functions and this type of thing where you can hide this complex sort of typing some way away in a function, and it doesn't cost you anything. You know, you get this for free, and you don't have to type it every time. I already talked about it yet. OK, so if we want to use CRTP and you know, polymorphic sense, what do we put in here? Well, the problem is shape needs a template parameter. So we can't put, you know, put rectangle in there. All we can do is the rectangles. We turn to variant and do the same thing we've done with variant. We do a visit. And in this case, we can call draw directly. We don't have to go through the overload because all of this is handled through calling shape. Now, in some ways, I was misleading with the examples digital pin the, the pin and serial port. If we had made all those names the same, like emit, instead of set, write, send, we could have done the same thing there. But that wouldn't have given me any opportunity to demonstrate the overload pattern. Again, need overload, need that type of 
polymorphism when you've got disparate classes. Or you may already have existing classes that you can't change. Maybe they're in a library. Maybe they're just embedded in this humongous system you're working on. But you want to do this type of polymorphic operation. One of the other places I, I used weight, uh, CRTP with was with my robot. If it's in an idle state, I start my program running, I've got to send it a message that says, wake up. Now that takes a few hundred milliseconds for it to get um, all ready to go again. And at that point, it sends me a message that says, I'm awake. Well, during that period of time, I do the other setup for the program. Then I get to the point where I've got to sit there and say, okay, I've got to wait for this message to come in. And it didn't really fit into an inheritance nicely. And I didn't, there's multiple classes that I'm working with, power being one of them and a couple others that needed this wait operation. So I turned to CRTP. And the wait for method here takes in the pointer to a member of the class we're gonna work with, and a timeout. And it casts to derived, the, the, the derived class, and then it calls the member function, which returns a stud optional, and if it's invalid, which means the message hasn't come in yet, the loop continues on until, until it times out. So with power, what I did was a public inheritance from wait floor, telling it I'm the power class. Create a power variable in my main program, and then I call power wait for, and I kept fighting with trying to find a cleaner way of doing this, but you've got to specify the full, full call here. Power uh, is awake. Couldn't just put awake in there somehow. Or couldn't get to interpret that this is power because I'm calling you from power. But anyway, this was another usage of CRTP. This is more an implementation usage than the other, which was more of a design usage. And then we've got explicit object parameter, which is defined in C++23, also known as deducing this. What deducing this means is we can now say when you normally call a member function, there's this hidden, this parameter that gets passed in. Well, we can expose that, this parameter, with deducing this. The first parameter on your member function can be specified as I want this, with this reference root to it, and give it a name, in this case, self. And in our situation, we call self draw impl. Simplifies the code, we no longer have to do the static cast. This also has an impact in general for eliminating the need to define a lot of duplicate functions, juggling reference and cast and const and, and other things. Read the proposal for this because it spells it out uh, in detail of why they, they, they created deducing this. So it changes our derived classes also because we no longer have to tell the parent class what we're doing, who we are. So general simplification. So CRTP can be considered an abstraction, can be considered a design pattern or activity, because it defines an interface for related types, but doesn't directly provide polymorphism, but we get that through variables anyway. Also note, you come back and do some research on this, you'll find that concepts are gonna change how CRTP works because you can eliminate some of the other aspects, uh, reduces some of the complexity here even more. I didn't have time to get into looking at the concepts and what, how, to, how to make them work and understand them enough to explain it. So we've got a number of different ways of creating probably more variables. We've got a couple ways of doing, getting them invoked without using virtual functions. Come back at 12.30 today, and I'm gonna do a reprise of a talk I did at CPP North, the journey into ranges, views, pipelines, and curry, same philosophy. Thank you.
Hope you enjoy CPPCon. And now go and learn more and use the code. Questions? And please use the microphone. I have worn hearing aids for like 45 years. Hello, thank you for, uh, for the talk. Uh, I have a question. Uh, is there any recommendation? Uh, where should we, what's the point where should we decide to use the uh, non polymorphic behavior that you just presented or just do a normal inheritance? Is there any recommendation so that we can know where should we use this or not? Um, if I understand the question, it was when you use these techniques yeah, versus exactly. inheritance type exactly. techniques. When you've got classes that don't really fit into the tree, yeah. you do an inheritance. But for example, you know, there are many people, well, the one I pointed out, there's a difference between pins and serial port. You know, where serial port uh, has different state. It's got a handle to a file system. Pins just have talked to their, their pins. They don't really fit in, the, in an in inheritance tree. It's a force fit if you do that. So I would use it in that case. Um, same with shapes. You know, the whole shape controversy is because people haven't, in my opinion, okay. fully understood that state is as important as behavior. So they look at behavior and said, I'm gonna put all these behaviors in a tree, ignoring state, and then they get complicated. Okay. Okay, thank you. Okay. Yep. I was curious if you were able to benchmark these techniques versus the bench, the vir versus virtual as a No, I've not done any performance testing. Uh, I've some seen some indications that some of this will be faster. In some testing that I have done in other situations, um, I've seen virtual can be faster than calling functions directly uh, because when you do a virtual function, you're making a decision. You're deciding which type to invoke. If you do the equivalent someplace else, you've got to do a decision. We saw the switch here. That's the decision process. And too often I see people comparing the two with even calling through pointer functions, functions to pointers and comparing the two, but they omit the switch statement, the decision process. The decision process can take more time than the uh, just walking through the pointer change to get to, to your function. As okay. a, a follow-up comment, I've seen uh, Fedor Pikov. He, he introduced a, a way to do branchless uh, programming. So it seems like you can avoid the, the branch using some sort of lookup table. But I really can't address that. I okay. Thank haven't you. thought it through. Anybody else? Okay, enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs>